To you who now, living in love and hope, who sense the future in the surrounding air, this testament is offered. The nation had gone mad and struck out everywhere the compass knew. Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, sharing power with the aging President von Hindenburg. August 1934, President von Hindenburg died. Hitler became absolute ruler of Germany. Now he could do what he had spelled out in Mein Kampf for all to see. In substance it was, Today, Germany, tomorrow, the world. Before Hitler came into power, the German army, by treaty, was limited to 100,000 men. October 1936, the Rome-Berlin Axis was formed. An unholy alliance of aggressors consolidating their forces for greater conquest. All this rearmament was strictly illegal, according to the Versailles Treaty. A would-be peaceful world learned that a vast military power had materialized out of nowhere, a power controlled by one man who tore up treaties as we tear up ticker tape. Drunk with power and bloodlust, the Nazis turned upon a large segment of their own German citizens. On March the 21st, 1933, the Munich press announced the opening of the first concentration camp near Dachau. German Jews were herded into concentration camps. The concentration camps were a brutal prelude to a ghastly program of mass extermination. On March the 12th, 1938, without warning, the German armies marched over the Austrian border. Why was Austria important to Hitler? It put him on the southern flank of Czechoslovakia, and Czechoslovakia was the key to the control of Eastern Europe. In return for Hitler's guarantee of world peace, Chamberlain and Eladje prevailed upon Czechoslovakia to give up the Sudetenland without a fight. Six months of declaring that he wanted no more territory anywhere, he violated the Munich Agreement marched in and took the whole of the Czech state. And on August 21st, 1939, the world was set on its heels by the announcement of a treaty between the Russians and the Germans. The Nazi leaders were now ready to strike. The hour had come. It was time to start conquering Eastern Europe. Precisely at dawn on September 1st, without warning, the German Wehrmacht rolled over the Polish border. England and France declared war for the second time in 25 years. But Germany did not strike at England or France yet. On the 9th of April, 1940, it struck at Denmark and Norway. In a disunited world, in a world where free men had not yet found their common cause, 
German aggression struck at them nation by nation and flung them down. Belgium, Sunday the 10th of May, 1940. Luxembourg that stood alone and Germany moved into the Dutch farmlands over Holland, neutral and alone. And the way having been cleared, the Maginot line outflanked, German power struck toward the center of France. And the armies arrived in Paris. Now there remained to finish England, tired England, who stood alone. Berlin. Hier ist der Großdeutsche Rundfunk. Die Abstärketten sind längst durchbrochen worden. Hunderttausend rufen noch nach dem Führer, dem sie noch einmal danken wollen. Es gibt keine Worte, mit denen man das schildern könnte, was sich hier abgespielt hat. And suddenly, turning without warning on his former ally, Hitler flung his armies against Soviet Russia in the most gigantic offensive in all history. On the 22nd of June, 1941, Germany, with tanks, planes, troops, and self-propelled guns, attacked the Soviet Union. Stalingrad. And beyond this, Germany would never go. Seeing them, the Red Army renewed with a terrible intensity its battle cry, Smirt fascist kim zachvachika, death to the fascist invader. But even before this, the free world had become one. After Pearl Harbor, we were united. Now, no nation was alone. Now, America, too, was the world's military partner. With their backs to the wall, the nations had joined hands. That was the secret of victory. For Germany's allies struck at America, and America struck back. With unity would come victory. I have been asked to be the spokesman for this Allied Expeditionary Force in saying a word of introduction to what you are about to see. It is a story of the Nazi defeat on the Western Front. So far as possible, the editors have made it an account of the really important men in this campaign. I mean the enlisted soldiers, sailors and airmen that fought through every obstacle to victory. Of course, to tell the whole story would take years. But the theme would be the same. Teamwork wins wars. In England, after months of planning and preparation, it was D-Day minus two. General Eisenhower was about to unleash the most massive amphibious invasion in history. During the big build-up, England had become a vast staging area for troops and the materiel of war. England in wartime is the land of blood, sweat, and tears. A nation blackened and battered by the fury of the Nazi Luftwaffe. But it's still England. And for young Americans on their way to war, there is much to see. Wartime Britain is a place supercharged with excitement. Literally the crossroads of the world. Every day was D-Day for the Air Force. From dawn to dawn, the sound of aeroplane engines filled the air. England, now a green and pleasant, unsinkable aircraft carrier, launched immense fleets of planes to scourge the enemy in Europe, blow down his factories, tear up his railroads, explode his ammunition dumps, fight his air force out of the sky, kill his troops, wherever they were to be found. No city in German Europe was safe against the onslaughts of the Dominion and American Air Force and the RAF. The bombs were dropped. On Schweinfurt, Bremen, Kiel, Wilhelmshaven, on the German production centers in France, beating Nazi war industry to its knees with a merciless arithmetic bomb tonnage. We 
kept bashing away at German targets, mostly steel and oil, the Ruhr, Hamburg, Battle of Berlin. Things were getting tougher every trip, more ground defences, more night fighters, more crews not coming back. Us bombardiers seemed to do nothing but look down on French bridges those days. We used to ask each other, have you cut any good bridges lately? Well, finally, there was only one whole railway bridge left over the Seine between Paris and the sea. the end of May, virtually all of southern England is one vast staging area. The roads of England are clogged with convoys as men and supplies begin the move down to the ports and the loading area. The Nazis also know what the Allied forces are preparing for. And they are making preparations of their own. Along the coastline, they have built an Atlantic wall, which Otto Hitler says will make Europe an impregnable fortress. By the spring of 1944, the Nazis know that an Allied invasion is imminent but they cannot tell when it will come or where. They think the attack most likely will strike where the distance across the channel is narrowest, at Calais. Consequently, their strongest forces and fortifications are concentrated here. The actual target is one of the best kept secrets of the war. The attack will come along a 50 mile stretch of coastline in the province of Normandy, dominated by the vital port of Cherbourg. A few of the many cameramen ready to cover D-Day. Of these war cameramen, we can only show you a few. But these are some of the men who will risk their lives to shoot this gigantic military venture. We were down on the south coast of England, where we met some of the other correspondents who were scheduled to cross the channel with us. And here we see Larry Lesseur of CBS. Ernie Pyle here, and this is a close-up of Jack Thompson of the Chicago Tribune, and this is O'Reilly, Larry O'Reilly of the Associated Press. This is Wurtenbecker. Uh, Pete Carroll here came from Boston, and he was a photographer for the Associated Press. And we're saying our farewells because we were expected to meet again in Paris. And I don't have to tell you who this man is imitating. He was a Notre Dame football player. I was told later on that he was killed in the action. D-Day minus one. Invasion forces began embarking in England. Destination, Normandy. Involved in this massive amphibious invasion were some three million soldiers, sailors, and airmen. 4,000 ships and boats. Operation Overlord, the code name for the invasion, was close at hand. Now as D-Day and H-Hour approach. These men who have come from so many countries and speak so many tongues, gather together in Great Britain to form this vast Move Allied it. army. Move it! Move! The Great Armada begins its ponderous move into the Channel waters. They gave us the final briefing then. We knew what to do and how. They told us where and when. Ever since I became a soldier, they were getting me ready for this. I tried to imagine how much fear I would have. 17,000 men of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Division, with over 2 million pounds of combat equipment and supplies, were airlifted to carefully selected drop zones behind the invasion beaches. Now begins a new period of waiting for the one final word. An invasion ship is a lonely ship, writes a correspondent who is there. It is a strange and suspended world, but heavy with memories of the more familiar world left behind. Nazi bombers attempt to smash the Armada, but they are driven off. 
The sky is filled with steel as plane after plane fails to break through the withering barrage. Now the enemy is throwing everything it has at the end. The invasion armada, the largest ever assembled, was now in position off the coast of France. While our assault forces prepared for H hour, Allied naval power began their concentrated shore bombardment. This was amphibious warfare on a scale that staggered the imagination. At Omaha Beach, in the first assault, 30,000 American troops stormed ashore. They called our beach Omaha. Don't ask me why. I understand Omaha was the roughest spot. We lost some good men, took a few prisoners. It was a lousy trade. You now you hear a lot about how long it takes to make battle-hardened soldiers out of green troops. Listen, I got to be a veteran in one day. That day. So they paved the beaches with our blood and lurched across the dunes and reached the roads. Aid stations were established on the spot. And an astounding record starts piling up. The checkup later reveals that 80 to 90 percent of the wounded received medical care within 10 minutes of being hit. The hard crust of the German West Wall was broken. The first batch of Nazi prisoners, the supermen who believed their West Wall impregnable, and a Frenchman to whom the stars and stripes spell liberty. He's waited a long time for this. With every passing hour, with each passing day, reinforcements streamed ashore to enlarge the beachhead with tanks, trucks, ammunition, and supplies. Ein Datum von weltgeschichtlicher Bedeutung. Unter dem Druck Moskaus haben Briten und Amerikaner die seit langem angekündigte und von uns erwartete Invasion begonnen. The Nazis were blind with rage. The German mind has never understood why free people fight on against overwhelming odds. Hitler now knew he was superior in every weapon, except the weapon of spirit. Our need for ports was vital as our breath. All our plans turned upon Cherbourg. All our strategy waited upon its empty docks and piers. So the Americans sent all across Normandy to the coast, swung toward the north, impatient for the port. The German knew our lack and swiftly drew his forces into tight defensive groups so to contest the issue. Yanks advance on Cherbourg. From 30 to 50,000 Nazis were trapped by General Omar Bradley's 1st United States Army closing in on Cherbourg. Bitter street fighting marks the last stage of the push. Cherbourg streets are a shambles as our troops drive doggedly toward the harbor. With the defenses reduced to rubble, General von Schlieben, military commander of Cherbourg's fortresses, surrenders. With him is Admiral Henneke, who received Hitler's Iron Cross for destroying Cherbourg's port facilities. And this is the beginning of the end. Cherbourg's grim defenders surrender. As the Allied liberation of France rolls forward, thousands of Hitler's hordes fall into our hands. During the first 30 days of the Norman campaign, the Germans suffered 75,000 casualties. Our own men show the scars of battle, too. Uh, 
I've covered them with a gun down to the clearing stations. Thousands of them. And all kinds. The tough ones with a smile froze stiff on their faces by shell fire. And the plain Joes that had too much and ready to tell you that. And their poker-faced officers that never lost the poker-faced look. The SS, the parachute troops, the old soldiers off the Russian front. I've seen them all. The Hitler youth babies, looking like they walked out of Lincoln High. Expert killers. Kids that knew how a machine gun worked and nothing else. All through and talking too much. Ready to swear he hated Hitler all the time. Smart Alec with their talk of rights under the Geneva Convention. And asking, when do we go to America? I never gave him more than the Geneva Convention. And that was all. Caen is a town through which the easy on ripples its slow way to the waiting sea, capital of Normandy. This was no Cherbourg advance, a knife thrust through the fields, but rather was the grinding of a drill, inch by inch forward. An der Front südlich Caen, SS-Panzergrenadiere in Erwartung eines starken gegnerischen Angriffs. Bei den letzten Durchbruchsversuchen verloren die Anglo-Amerikaner innerhalb einer knappen Woche über 500 Panzer. Operation Cobra. By the end of the month, United States forces stood at the base of the peninsula, at the gates of the province of Britain. The reaching of a branch signified the culmination of the breakthrough and the point at which our forces split for the westward and eastward drives in the breakout. The trap the Allies closed at Argentan and Falaise, where they virtually destroyed two German field armies. For the weary American troops, it was a welcome respite, a time to relax. Here we see Edward G. Robinson, who's one, one of the many actors and actresses that came to Normandy to entertain our troops. They held a, a show right in this Normandy barn. after washing out of a helmet for many weeks, decided to use this beautiful lake for a bath. They were permitted to do so because they were fighting the enemy at an area called St. Malo. And incidentally, Germans held out at St. Malo for many months. On July 20th, a dramatic event electrified the world and revealed that there was no relaxation inside the enemy camp. Hitler himself announced that a cabal of high-ranking army officers had tried to assassinate him with a bomb in order to seize political power. After four years, the Allies have secured themselves on the soil of France. As the American War Secretary said, we are here to stay until France is liberated and Germany defeated. Into the Normandy countryside, the troops of freedom-loving nations march against the forces of tyranny. The faces of liberated Frenchmen tell their own stories. The Allied troops are received as long-awaited friends. Peasants show them the way, warn them where to expect mines and give all possible help. The Allies have found firm resistance and are prepared for even stronger contests.
Cezambra Island in the harbor of St. Malo, where resisting Nazis blocked Allied use of St. Malo's port, first of Brittany's harbors isolated after the breakthrough from Normandy. Refusing to surrender, the Nazi garrison is once more attacked, this time from a hill near Dinar, where Americans used captured Nazi self-propelled 155mm howitzers. Capitulation came only after a siege of more than three weeks. Cameramen are in the front lines and constantly under fire. The 100,000 people of Rennes are free once again. The people of Brittany have a glorious and dramatic record of resistance to the Nazis. As these pictures were made, Rennes was the largest French city yet taken. To the Americans who captured Rennes, these scenes of enthusiasm are becoming almost a daily sight. As the Germans were meeting disaster in northwestern France, the United States Seventh Army, combat-hardened veterans of the fighting in Italy, hit the beaches in southern France on the morning of August 15th. The convoy gets underway, heading toward beaches between Toulon and Caen. Landings begin at 0800 hours, supported by covering fire from battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. Three divisions, accompanied by French troops, made the original assault. beaches, reinforcements and equipment are ready to be landed. Landing heavy equipment as the original beachhead expands east and west. By D plus one, the invaders held a coastal strip 40 miles long, 20 miles deep. Films of the southern France invasion indicating the extensive preparations for the opening of the fourth front in the grand strategy to smash the Nazi European fortress. At Saint-Tropez, a tribute to the French forces of the interior for cooperation during the first days of the attack. Patriots are now reported to control 14 departments in southern France, totaling 50,000 square miles. They've not only been active in sabotaging the enemy's lines of communications, but have tied down substantial German forces. After four years of underground activity, the FFI meets an ally on liberated French soil. When the Allies landed, we fought in the open. But the price we paid for it was frightful. In the village of Oradour, alone, the Germans slaughtered 1,100 out of the 1,200 population. And the place was completely burned. Maki recruits are instructed in the use of firearms. These are patriots of the French underground movement men who resisted Nazi domination for four years. French patriots, their job is to remove Nazi strong points, clearing the way for allied columns. The street fighting begins. underground fighters shadowed German snipers who remained behind. Sometimes the unseen snipers fire at their own countrymen to discourage surrender. French patriots round up collaborationists. landings 15th August near Saint-Tropez and Saint-Maxime, advance elements pushed along the coast and inland against light opposition. The thrilling music of the Marseillaise takes on new meaning.
deliverance has come so suddenly to these people, they are slow to realize the nightmare of occupation is over. This is but a foretaste of things to come as the Allies move forward. The V for victory sign, once the symbol of a hope, is now a reality. The drive into the heart of France was deeper now. The first army flanking the third. The main body of the Nazi 19th Army has retreated up the narrow Rhone Valley and Allied forces press forward to block escape routes. Numerous French towns are liberated en route. These children, whose entire lives have known nothing but Nazi rule, meet a new kind of warrior. Yet the Normandy people had not felt German oppression at its worst. It was here the Germans rested their troops after their mauling in Russia. In the south, as well as in the north, staggering losses pile up for Hitler's divisions wherever the Allies manage to outmaneuver the retreating Nazis. Retreat for Nazi forces caught on the wrong side of the line was cut off. We rounded up our share of prisoners. The desperate plight of Hitler's armies became more apparent as the bewildered legions of a once mighty, destructive force found themselves defeated by an army they had been repeatedly told would never last on the soil of the Third Reich longer than nine hours. to the beaches, bewildered, hopelessly depressed men. This is the March Upon Britain, version 1944. These men are evidence that the Allies are chewing deeper and deeper into the Atlantic Wall. St. Michel was on a river that separated Normandy from Brittany. And here we met some of the other correspondents. This is Bob Capper of Time magazine. This is Charles Collingwood and uh, Helen Kirkpatrick of the Chicago Daily News. And Joe Liebling of New Yorker magazine, the ball-headed chap and Wurtenbecker on the extreme left, Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway was covering Collier's magazine. Here he is seen talking with Bill Walton. And these are just moments that we could take a little time out to rest. The man in the center in this picture is Bill Stringer, and he was killed trying to get into Paris. One of the things that correspondents tried to do was to get into Paris before anyone else Here it was mid-August, and we'd been slugging our way ever since we hit the Normandy beaches in June. Up ahead somewhere was Paris, but it didn't look like we'd be lucky enough to see it. We even heard that de Gaulle now wasn't as worried about the Nazis as trouble from the different factions in the resistance movement trying to take over. So our top brass decided it would be better to take Paris than to have a civil war at our backs, and that de Gaulle would have his wish that French troops would be the first ones to enter. They came closer to Paris, but so slowly it seemed. Now we learn that Leclerc was slowed not only by the enemy, 
Each step nearer to us, tumultuous welcomes delayed his troops. <laughs> Communists, fascists, criminals. In four years, the Nazi occupation had bred a disease of hatred and greed in desperate men. Spirits rotted by collaboration, by dreams of power. Now we woke them in a hurry. In the Montparnasse railroad station, a command post was set up by General Leclerc. Now he prepared to go and receive the Nazi surrender. The German capitulation in Paris. General Leclerc is present as the Nazi garrison is officially surrendered by its commander, Lieutenant General Dietrich von Schultz. After four years, de Gaulle. For us, all this time, he had been France away from France. Now again, he was a part of us. The streets and the squares, Paris filled them for his welcome. To de Gaulle, we could look for order to make Paris and France one again. Paris, the most coveted city in history. Since its beginnings 2,000 years ago, Paris has drawn to it lovers of beauty, of learning, and of liberty. Each dawn is a new beginning. For us who have lived in Paris all of our lives, for us who live here from day to day, it is more than a city. It is a way of life. It is a meeting every day of the present with our sometimes glorious, yes, and sometimes bitter past. It is civilization, Paris is. It is the spirit each day reborn in three million lives that makes us one. General Dwight D. Eisenhower visits Paris. Allons, enfants de la patrie, le jour de gloire est arrivé. The Supreme Commander's party includes Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, Deputy Supreme Commander, Lieutenant General Omar N. Bradley, and Lieutenant General Joseph Pierre Koenig, Military Governor of Paris. The first parade of American troops in the newly liberated capital of France. We had a parade ourselves a couple of days later, but it wasn't really much of a celebration for us. We still had a man-sized war going on right outside of town. We paraded through Paris in combat formation because the streets were still so jammed that a parade was the only way we could get through town, to pick up the war on the other side. A glimpse of a familiar building or a monument from the corner of an eye, and before we knew it, we were through it. That was all the look at Paris some of us ever had.
toward the Reich frontiers, Americans advanced. Against the ports hugging the channel, garrisoned in force by desperate foes, Canadians were sent. And in a thunderous sweep, the British armor surged toward awaiting Brussels. The Wehrmacht is finding less and less time in their swift backtracking to Germany to practice the vandalism they were able to indulge during earlier campaigns. Sweeping all the way across Luxembourg, the First Army breaches enemy defenses before the Reich. Crossings of the German frontier from Luxembourg were made on 11th September. D plus 97. Following the initial crossings of the Reich frontier, First Army units attack Siegfried Line fortifications. General Hodges' advance patrols move on the West Wall emplacements. On 16th September, rapid passage is made after combat engineers cleared a lane through Dragon's Teeth. I remember one day we were coming across a big flat field. I hopped a barbed wire fence and a guy says to me, guess what? So I says, what? So he says, you're in Germany. Every line must somewhere have an end. In southeast Holland, nothing lay between the British army and the German plain except two rivers and a town. Towards the end, we knew the situation was bad. We knew we were hemmed in. We knew it was possible we wouldn't get out. More than anything, I remember the way everyone behaved. Men you knew as the toughest fighters became gentle, kind and considerate to each other. I knew a lot more about men after Arnhem. If the Allied Operation Market Garden had succeeded, the Siegfried line would have been outflanked. The important bridge across the Vaal River was kept intact. A regiment of the U.S. 82nd Airborne Division crossed the river in assault boats to overcome the German defenders. Explosives were already in place for the destruction of the span. British engineers removed the charges. Liberated citizens, under German rule since the spring of 1940. Germany gateway to the Rhineland is in ruins 18th October following Nazi rejection of the American ultimatum. Resistance ends on the 20th after a fortnight of fighting for the city. 15,000 of a normal population of 160,000 remain behind during the final attack. Aachen in ruins, sacrificed by the Germans to buy time. General Hodges' forces drive eastward carrying with them the first major Allied victory on German soil. Into the gloom of a forest, straight from the German folk tales of the Brothers Grimm, the stifling embrace of its densely interwoven trees obscuring the sky itself, the Hürtgen Forest, a name that would come to symbolize the long drawn heartbreak and despair of war as surely as its fairy tale counterparts had enshrined the nightmares of childhood. On the 16th of December, 1944, the German counteroffensive struck. German Field Marshal von Rundstedt suddenly sent a dozen elite divisions smashing into the Ardennes sector. In the Ardennes, we were fighting two battles, one against the Germans, the other against the weather. It's hard to say which was the worst. Certainly, it gave us more trouble. 
stalled our armored units, disrupted supply and communications, and froze our weapons. There was little we could do to fight it. If our lines of communication could be cut, the fate of our armies might be in the balance. This was the Battle of the Bulge. 24 hours after leaving the Roar, elements of the division were in the Ardennes and had made contact with the Germans. The rest of the division was right behind us. We met the enemy and finally pushed them back. It was during this action in besieged Vestal that General McAuliffe, who was then commanding the 101st, made his famous reply to the German demand that he surrender. That reply was reportedly one word long, nuts. If the enemy did not immediately understand the meaning of McAuliffe's typical American reply, the action which followed undoubtedly convinced him that it meant that the Americans had no intention of surrendering. By that time, we knew we were going to see a winter campaign. There was no way out of it. The Germans were dug in and they were tough. And it was plain that until we got a lot stronger, we weren't going anyplace. President Roosevelt spoke many of our hopes when he said, the tide of battle has turned slowly and inexorably. We pray that with victory will come a new day of peace on earth in which all nations of the earth will join together for all time. May that spirit live and grow throughout the world in all the years to come. The enemy's stubborn resistance against our drive to Rare River Line objectives at Lunik and Yulik has cost him losses in both men and materiel. Smoke screens the advance as the 9th Army continues northeast from Aachen, while the 1st Army advances due east from Durin. The summer months alone had taken over a million German casualties, and now new and uncounted numbers pressed the total to near four million since the war began. The storm breaks in full final fury on the German line. Suddenly the world is thrilled with the news of a startling achievement. A bold spearhead of Lieutenant General Courtney H. Hodges' 1st Army captures the Rhine Bridge at Remagen. The startled Nazis react with desperate efforts to destroy it. In the meantime, a pontoon bridge is thrown across the river. For 10 days, it withstands aerial attacks and constant artillery fire while 1st Army troops exploit the initial breaching of the Rhine River line. Weakened by the cumulative damage, the Ludendorff collapses on 17th March while about 300 engineer troops are working on it. Many of them are hurled into the swift icy water or crushed by the falling structure. Armor is raced across the new link as the Remagen bridgehead begins expanding into a wide front. The enemy's river line is gone. His secondary positions are overrun. The tanks and troops start driving forward. They have a rendezvous to keep with the Red Army, and they intend to be on time. Cologne, first crack in the Rhine armor, lies before onrushing tank elements of the 1st Army. So rapid is the tank advance that German strong points are overrun before effective resistance can be offered. Two years of ceaseless bombings have reduced Cologne, Germany's fourth largest city, 
to a heap of rubble. Germany's pride as well as her men were dealt mortal wounds at Cologne. Our units report no house-to-house -house resistance by the Volkssturm. All over occupied Germany, the pattern remains the same. The battle, the swift driving on of the armies, the civilians who come out of their shelters, the posting of allied proclamations, and a stunned and beaten people, cut off from the outer world, cut off even from its neighbors, is given orders and obeyed. no longer stands a German line in the West. Instead, American, Canadian, and British troops drive forward on almost every sector, enveloping small pockets of resistance and crumbling hedgehogs. The prisoner told us the newest Jerry gag. If an aircraft shows up white, it's American. If it shows up dark, it's British. And if it never shows up, it's the Luftwaffe. The first undamaged jet plane to be captured in the European war. It's an ME-262 with a top speed of 600 miles and normally carries two 500-pound bombs. The working day begins as it will end with the ground crews, as much a part of the fortress as her wings. If you're a mechanic, you know when your ship goes out on a mission, you may never see it again. So you do your work as well as it can be done, perfectly because you wouldn't want anything to go wrong that would be your fault. fighter planes operating in the skies of Western Europe against the German Air Force. This is the P-47, the Thunderbolt, a fast, tough, high-altitude fighter with a dive like its name and an eight-gun blast in its wings. Here is the Lightning, the P-38, master of the air in many theaters of war. The long range and concentrated firepower are counted in Western Europe, too. Into these great fighters, America poured its genius. It's millions of man-hours of labor, it's faith in victory against the Luftwaffe. And in their single cockpits, it placed its carefully chosen sons, trained to a fighting edge, trained as never before. Here is their report, catch as catch could, by their own gun cameras in the instant of action.
It was war. War demanding new men, new courage, and giving nothing in return, but those demands pressed harder. The ever-mounting ferocity with which the Nazis have battled to stem the American advance exacts a high cost in pain and suffering. American ambulance men are busy everywhere. I can remember every case we ever had, especially the first one. The ambulance brought him in late one afternoon. I came over to where he was lying and he looked up and grinned. I asked him how he felt. He said something about the, the German with a machine pistol using him for a dartboard. He was quiet and patient and a little bewildered. He'd never been hurt before. He asked how the fighting was going, and then he passed out. The doctor came over and looked at his wounds and, and swore. He said he had no business to be alive. We put him on the operating table and did what we could. The doctor kept swearing all the time he was operating. We couldn't stop the bleeding. I remember the radio news that night. They said the casualties had been surprisingly light. These are some of Europe's stranded millions, displaced persons, participants in the largest, swiftest mass migration in history. Wrested from their homes by war and German labor conscription, freed by a live victory, but homeless, the displaced peoples are now being quickly relocated. In the American and British occupation zones alone, there have been more than six and a half million displaced persons to be fed, sheltered, and helped out of Germany. On his arms, the Germans had tattooed his prison number. Like a fella said, there's a lot more than towns going to have to be reconstructed. West would also go tens of thousands of French civilians who had been condemned to work as slaves in Germany. Three million Frenchmen had been held in Germany. They come back to their loved ones, to the warmth of home, and to liberty. At least 3,000 political prisoners died here at the brutal hands of SS troops and pardoned German criminals who were the camp guards. Nordhausen had been a depository for slaves found unfit for work in the underground V-bomb plants and in other German camps and factories. American medical crews find 2,000 still alive at the camp. They are discovered inside filthy barracks where the survival and death were contingent on how long human existence was possible on the daily ration of potato fields, one slice of bread, and an occasional bowl of soup. The dead quickly outnumbered the living. The survivors are shown being evacuated for treatment in Allied hospitals. The victims are mainly Poles and Russians with considerable numbers of French and other nationalities also included in the camp roster. Hitler's most terrifying secret weapon, the V-2 rocket, is disclosed. A weapon that just one year earlier might have changed the entire course of the war. The V-2 normally combines four essential elements. Casing, explosive, fuel, and control mechanisms. Reaching a speed of 3,000 miles an hour, it's been known to reach England five minutes after launching from the Netherlands over 200 miles away. Third Army fight their way south on the road to Nuremberg. Resistance was heavy, the last fanatical defenders are beaten down. The town is won, the advance goes on. Smashed, death-ridden, and in allied hands. 
It was in Nuremberg, the holy city of Nazism, that each year before the war a great party rally was held at which Hitler spoke. Crowds gather in the marketplace to hear Allied orders, to read the Allied proclamations disbanding the Nazi party, Nazi laws and institutions. Civilians, conscious that they are thoroughly beaten, obey readily. Post-war Germany will have no armies. Arms are surrendered, pistols, swords, daggers, sabers. They will be destroyed. The Seventh Army holds the review where Hitler's great rallies were held. Here, thousands once gathered to bellow Sieg Heil when Hitler screamed. The close continued, preparing for the junction of the Russian and Allied armies. Germany is almost split in two. We waited for the East and West to meet. We linked up with the Ruskies at the Elbe River. I hung around for a couple of days with a Tommy gunner named uh, Konikov. He didn't know any English, so I taught him to say my aching back, and he taught me Tavarish. That means comrade. We drank toast to Len Leeson, had a million laughs. Then old Konikov found an interpreter and gives a toast to the great American soldier. That stopped me. We did all right, but I don't like to think where we'd have been without them. I'm very, very glad to have met you. Very glad indeed. Благодарим вас за помощь, которую оказали в этом войне против гитлеровской Германии. Thank you very much. We don't understand the language, but we mean the same thing. Russian wax and American women war correspondents dance with Joe and Ivan. While one and all toast the unity that has brought them so far to victory and will carry them still further to a lasting peace. It was here in Munich in 1923 that Hitler founded his Nazi party in the Bürgerbräu Keller. Much of Munich lies in ruins. Famous beer hall. Little remains. Haus der Deutschen Kunst in München. Von diesem Bauwerk nahm die Wiedergeburt der deutschen Baukunst ihren Ausgang. Mit der Gestaltung des königlichen Platzes in München gelang dem Schöpfer des neuen deutschen Baustils in überzeugender Weise die architektonische Darstellung der Macht des neuen Reiches. Near München, Dachau, Factory of Horror.
this was different, very different. I, I don't know any words big enough to make you understand what we all felt. They say, I'm, I'm not squeamish, but, well, I'm human and thank God for it. Nineteen thirty five saw the passing of the Nuremberg anti Jewish laws. Thousands of Jews were arrested at random and sent to the concentration camps. Twelve thousand to Dachau alone. In the course of the war, the concentration camps were systematically developed to form a reservoir of slaves. How can you work twelve or fourteen hours a day in the quarry, in the forests, or in the armaments factory, with only a plateful of thin soup in your belly? when your hands shake and your innards shrink. In the last four months in Dachau, more than 13,000 people died. They died of hunger, tuberculosis, typhus. Some froze to death. Others did not survive the tortures to which they were subjected. The ovens burnt day and night. Incoming prison trains arrived, carrying more dead than living. Those strong enough to travel were brought to Dachau from outlying points which were threatened by the Allied advance. This is how they looked when they arrived. All these people had been slaves, slaves of a system designed to destroy human dignity. The hardest hit were the Jews. Following the Nazi proclamation of the final solution, all Jews were destined for extermination. Most of them died in the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Dachau was a concentration camp no longer. The SS and their helpers had run away, had been shot or imprisoned. Those who survived swore that the time they had spent there should never be lost and forgotten, that everything must be done to ensure that there can never be another Dachau. Now they knew the whole truth, and they knew what the name Dachau would always mean to the outside world. Those of the 30,000 who could stand stood on the parade ground once again as free men. Priest and communist, German and Pole, intellectual and worker, they all celebrated the day of liberation from slavery. One of the first war criminals is captured, Hermann Goering. The number two Nazi has the blood of thousands on his hands, and for that he will have to answer. He wears few of his prized medals as he's taken to headquarters for preliminary questioning by 7th Army officers and to surrender his arms. Members of the American and British press are present to interview the former head of the Luftwaffe. And, you guessed it, he blames everything on his old pal, Hitler. Aus dem Führerhauptquartier wird gemeldet, dass unser Führer Adolf Hitler heute Nachmittag seinem Befehlsstand in der Reichskanzlei bis zum letzten Atemzuge gegen den Bolschewismus kämpfend gefallen ist. Am 30. April hat der Führer den Großadmiral Dönitz zu seinem Nachfolger ernannt. Berchtesgaden, die Perle des Ruperti-Winkels, eine der schönsten Landschaften Deutschlands. Länger als ein Jahrzehnt war diese Gegend ein Reservat der Machthaber des Dritten Reiches. Hier bauten sie ihre Landsitze mit einem Kostenaufwand von über 500 Millionen Mark. In southern Germany, allied troops move forward to complete the occupation of the country. Prize thief among the high Nazis was Hermann Goering, who looted museums and private collections in all parts of Europe. Much was hidden in caves, 
and advancing troops captured fully laden freight cars, ready to move much of the collection to safer places for Herman. The false security of Betches Garden, from where so much of the world's tragedy was planned and directed, was shattered in April by a force of Allied heavy bombers. Arriving at daybreak, they attacked Hitler's notorious mountain hideout and the chalet in the valley below with 12,000-pound bombs fused for deep penetrations. Hitler's mountain retreat at Berchtesgaden has been transformed into a GI playground. Hitler is gone. Yes, the GIs have taken over, and the men of the 101st Airborne even have Hitler's lofty eagle's nest at their disposal. He is said to have used it only four times. In Austria, the last German armies in the Southern Redoubt had already been surrendered. Lieutenant General Brandenburger of the 19th German Army came down over the Brenner with his chiefs of staff to sign the capitulation in the small Austrian city of Innsbruck. Town after town surrenders. For them, the bombing is over, the enemy commander surrenders, and with him, the tired and battle-grimed remnants who had fought it out. The population comes out of its cellars. More and more swiftly, the German edifice is crumbling. Its battle is almost ended. Its last hour has almost come. As the British and Canadians swerve toward the Zyder Z, the Americans cross the Elbe and the Russians the Oder. Germany is crumbling. But armor and men of the American Ninth Army have tough going on the road to Hanover. In other parts of Germany, Allied armor sweeps through without resistance. The tank columns fan out toward Stuttgart, Schweinfurt, Erfurt, Magdeburg, Brunswick, Bremen. All Germany in the target. The rate of German surrenders is nearly a million a month as Allied armor rushes relentlessly toward the heart of Germany. What about the ideas in their heads? They have to be demobilized and got back to work. But let one man or woman who still believes in the Nazi regime or the destiny of the German people to rule the world take office and you have the beginnings of another war. is the job of denazification undertaken by the U.S. military government. On trial or awaiting trial before special German courts are some two million indicted Nazis. Penalties for the guilty range from long terms at hard labor for the worst offenders to fines for those less culpable.
für 9. Mai 1945, das Oberkommando der Wehrmacht gibt bekannt. Seit Mitternacht schweigen nun an allen Fronten die Waffen. Auf der Fehl des Großadmirals hat die Wehrmacht den aussichtslos gewordenen Kampf eingestellt. Damit ist das fast sechsjährige Ringen zu Ende. Es hat uns große Siege, aber auch schwere Niederlagen gebracht. Die deutsche Wehrmacht ist am Ende einer gewaltigen Übermacht unterlegen. At one minute after midnight, May the 9th, 1945, the guns stopped. D plus 337. Now the war against Germany is won. President Truman announced the official surrender. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. United, the peace-loving nations have demonstrated in the West that their arms are stronger by far than the might of dictators or the tyranny of military cliques that once called us soft and weak. Yesterday morning at General Eisenhower's headquarters Grand Admiral Dönitz the designated head of the German state signed the act of unconditional surrender. London celebrates. The royal family at Buckingham Palace joins in the historic event. London emerges at last from years of darkness, terror and destruction. alliés de l'Ouest et de l'Est. Le commandement français était présent et parti à l'acte de capitulation. where German Kaisers first plotted world domination, Britons, Russians, and Americans meet after crushing those ambitions. 
They face far-reaching decisions. Important problems resulting from final victory in Europe and organization of the post-war world are the vital questions before the conference. In Potsdam versammeln sich wieder die Vertreter der drei Mächte zu den letzten Sitzungen. Sie beschließen, dass Deutschland von Grund auf entwaffnet werden soll. Ein Rat der Außenminister wird in London seinen Sitz haben. Einer der ersten Aufgaben des Rates wird der Entwurf der ersten Friedensverträge sein. British and Canadians roll into Berlin to occupy their slice of the German capital. With the Russians and the United States, they will rule the city. The fate of the German capital was sealed when the Soviets launched their offensive across the Oder River. The Nazis boasted that they would turn Berlin into a Stalingrad. They failed. Berlin, the city where Hitler planned a total war, becomes a total wreck. Shattered and pulverized by months of unceasing air raids, ground into a vast pile of lifeless rubble by Russian bombardment. lifeless. Well, a lot of Germany is dead. We not only smashed up the towns, but smashed up the links between the towns. And at the finish, life in Germany just ran down like a clock. Place and time meant nothing because the people, the links between the people were smashed too. They were just left wandering, searching, looking for food, looking for their homes, looking for each other. Ich suche Frieda Windler, Königsberg. Ich suche meine Frau, Elfriede Schulz und Tochter Christa. Achtung, Stalingrad-Kämpfer. Wer kennt den Sanitätsunteroffizier Heinz Kuhlmann? There are 70 million people in Germany and about 30 million of them are looking for someone. Wir suchen unsere Muttis und Vaters, bitte helft sie uns wiederfinden. Wir sind Kindermann geflüchtet von Bromberg mit meinem Onkel zusammen. Ich der Flucht mein Onkel verloren. Der vierjährige Dieter, Familienname unbekannt, hat die Eltern auf der Flucht verloren. Hans Dieter, ebenfalls ohne Familiennamen. Wolfgang Krämer, fünf Jahre alt, gefunden im Wald bei Neubrandenburg-Mecklenburg mit seinem vierjährigen Bruder Günther Krämer. Man fand ihn mit geöffneten Pulsadern. Horst Dieter Schulz wurde auf dem Transport von Königsberg gefunden. Christiane Körber aus Danzig. Meine Mutter hat sich vergiftet und mein Vater war zuletzt auf Fehler auf einem Kriegsschiff. Zwei Millionen Flüchtlinge sind in weniger als drei Monaten nach Berlin geströmt. Graue Prozessionen des Elends, die Nahrung und Unterkunft dort suchen, wo sie schon kaum reichen für die einheimische Bevölkerung. Berlin ist arm und eng. Die Nomaden müssen weiterziehen. 
Nur außerhalb der Großstadt können Sie ein Asyl für die schlimmste Notzeit finden. Millionen Deutsche werden jetzt nach Deutschland übergeführt. Nach der Erklärung von Potsdam sollen die Umsiedlungen in geordneter und humaner Weise durchgeführt werden. In den vier Besatzungszonen Deutschlands sind umfangreiche Maßnahmen zur Unterbringung der Umsiedler ergriffen worden. These are Germans on the road who had asked for total war. They are still stunned by what hit them, stunned by the war they started. Underneath the rubble, there are people living, living in the cellars. The smoke from the cooking stoves drips up from the ruins to the open third story where people are living too. The fluted columns of Berlin's Reichstag background for the international black market, patronized by friend and foe alike. Berliners are eager to purchase goods they've been so long without. A pack of American cigarettes brings 100 marks. Even in Paris, the price is only 10 marks. All prices are exorbitant, but trade is brisk. Troops go sightseeing in the once great city, and everywhere famous landmarks are in ruins, most damaged beyond repair. Most popular with the soldiers is a visit to the chancellery for a souvenir of the former occupant, Hitler. Berlin's women have been set to work to clear up the rubble from the streets. It will be years before the scars of war are removed, if ever. The Germans pay the price of war. How many German houses were burned that winter and spring? How many German fields littered? How many German vineyards cut down? There will be silence in Germany for a long, long time. The German people who allowed its leaders to lead it into war have discovered the tragedy of war. This is Germany, land of darkness, of moral collapse. And a united world has learned through its dead, through its much pain, but only in unity of us all is there hope for any of us. If we forget that, in the end this long war will have been in vain. Germany. These German people have never in their history fought for their own internal individual freedom until they know the meaning of freedom, of dignity for every citizen. There is no hope for Germany in a civilized world. The world has lost much, but Germany who was so mad as to forget the world Germany has lost the most of all. To the victor belongs the spoils. That's what they say. Well, what are the spoils? Only this. A chance to build a free world. Better than before. Maybe the last chance. Remember that.
Thank you.